when I was a child, the lake was about 10,000 kilometers square. And actually now, it's about 1,200 kilometers square. This week, Storm Anna has hit southern African countries of Madagascar, Mozambique, and Malawi. With each country experiencing deaths and severe infrastructure damage, with some houses collapsing, trapping people under the rubble. To deny Africa the use of gas, which is far more environmentally less polluting than charcoal, kerosene, and heavy fuel oil, is to kill African economists. We are in the, at the point of losing Lake Chad, and it's going to be a total disaster if such could eventually happen in such a landscape whereby millions of people depend on it for survival. And now the armed group are using those situations uh, when we talk about the loss of life fluids as a power, powerful weapon against um, peace. Because we are seeing it that in Nigeria we are an agrarian society. That means we depend on agriculture for most of our employment, livelihoods, and the rest. So once uh, our natural resources are being eat or shrinking or depleted, definitely it's going to affect many things in our society. Some parts of Lagos are almost underwater, if not underwater, because of flooding and sea level rise, like in terms of the fact that coastal communities are slowly being wiped away. Because recently, I went back to Makodi, uh, I saw one of the internally displaced people camp at where I've never seen before, because I graduated from that school, and when I returned back, I saw that there is an internally displaced people camp. And I was wondering what would have made this to happen, because this was formerly not there. So when I went there, I asked, I, I, I seek permission and I ask them what, what happened and they could narrate their storyline of them running away due to insurgency between the clashes of the farmers and the headsmen. As it affects them, it's also going to affect our food security. All your activities, all your production activities in Nigeria are so disturbing. So I also stay in Port Harcourt, that's the second that's where my home is, that's where my family stays. And we're having this terrible issue of soot, it's an air pollution issue. So basically, as a result of gas flaring, like the effect, one of the activities of oil product, production, um, as oil companies, fossil fuel companies, like it started as a little issue, but now it is terrible. Like if you like, if you wear a white shirt, you just have to be certain that you get a smudge of black stuff on it. Or if you clean your table, the dust is thick black. And I can see, I can know the contrast because I'm staying in two different cities, right? Like I, when I when I when I went to Port every morning, I'm just like so worried about the fact that this is what my parents, my siblings are still in Port Harcourt. This is what they're beating every single day. global warming. This global warming is definitely going to affect us more than anybody else, not just on the, on the, 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 the temperature, temperature rise aspect, but keep in mind our population is the fastest growing population. One in four people in the next 30 to 40 years will be African. How are you going to feed those people? But the bottom line is there's a lot of things that can be done on the continent to, you know, uh, minimize this impact dramatically. And so the first, part, again, I go back to education. We're not educating people. We need to stop subsidizing fossil fuel. Most African countries subsidize fossil fuels. Uh, fer fertilizer that are mixed with, you know, petroleum and all those things, you know, uh, and, and use organic ones. There's a lot of things you can do. But again, all those are legal aspect that has a lot of forces behind with the big oil industry and all those things that are lobbying and corrupting sometimes our, our government.
it is important in, as we uh, move forward in designing economic development programs that in fact we include the cost of climate resilience within those programs. Uh, we also include the cost of doing smart agriculture, meaning agriculture that will be able to withstand the vagaries of climate change so that our agricultural practices will build in smart agriculture and climate resilient agricultural systems. I think right now the issue about culpability is really a minor issue. I think in the early days we talked about it, you know, Africa is not culpable, the problem is from elsewhere. We bear the externalities, you know, we bear the burden um, and all of these are relevant issues. But I think now, you know, if your house is on fire and you're waiting for your neighbour to come and put it out for you, then you might end up losing your life and the life of your family. The, the rest of the world could, you know, in, in, in the interest of enlightened self-interest, could, could come in and help. But, you know, we can't, we can't wait forever where we're, we're already feeling the impacts in our agricultural systems, we're feeling the impact from an energy perspective, from a population, um, cities, um, urbanization perspective, air pollution, biodiversity loss, the impacts are everywhere. So whilst we're waiting for the benign support from our neighbours and others who've created a problem, we have to do something about it because we are going to contribute to our own death if we don't.